there are really huge shifts in the overall economy. Um, and look, capital is mobile. You know, manufacturing sources are mobile. The only thing that isn't mobile is your workforce. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Untapped with Upsmith. We are really thrilled to have a friend and a person I've known for several years here with us. Stefan is an infrastructure investor, uh, currently a partner at Anton Infrastructure Partners, and very focused on the future of investing in electrification transition and big ways society is changing. Workforce is a big important part of that. And so having a chance to learn from you today is awesome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So excited. Before we get into all those big words and the future stuff, we like to take it back. So tell us, give us your story. How did you get to where you are now, both in, you know, the LinkedIn kind of career steps, but also yeah. your childhood? Did you always know that you would do something like this? I was born to invest in the energy transition. <laughs> um, no, definitely not. Uh, I, I would say it's a, a, a long and circuitous path mm -hmm. uh, full of full of random moments. Um, the, the thing that is interesting, I am probably a child of the transatlantic corporation. So, uh, born and raised in Germany, uh, and then actually went to kindergarten in Corvallis, Oregon, believe it or not. So my, my neighbors still make fun of me today saying that I came back as a six year old speaking German with an American accent uh, from, from Oregon, from, from Oregon. Um, and, um, you know, being being a child of that sort of, um, you know, that that period after the fall of the wall, um, the American army uh, basically sent a lot of uh, a lot of their personnel back, um, and that gave me an opportunity to actually attend an international school mm. uh, because there were a lot of of empty slots, um, and and I was, you know, I, I spoke English, um, and so that probably set me on a path to to going abroad. Um, did my undergrad in the UK, um, started working there, uh, and then came to the US for grad school, uh, and sort of classic story thinking, you know, I was going to stay in the US for a year or two and then life happened and, uh, we're now 15 years later and I'm still here. <laughs> still in, in New York? Still in New York. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Spent two years in Singapore in the meantime, okay. just a, just a quick hop. Um, but otherwise I've always, have always been in New York. What kept you? Was it the food? What kept how did how did we <laughs> lure you and keep you? Yeah, um, so it's interesting, right? I I, I know, y y you know, you guys sort of have you know have a background growing up in rural areas. I always you know grew up in big cities. Um, I'm an only child. My wife's an only child. Um, and I think us coming to the states, living here in the states, um, our families are very far away. Um, and so what that means is that. The city is our family, like our friends are our family. Our, it, you know, our, our our friends are sort of the family that you choose, right? Um, and so I think we that that has led us to um, to really having a really strong community here, um, and and seeking people that have similar values, uh, similar views, uh, similar outlooks on life. And the wonderful thing about New York is, you know, whatever your fancy, whatever you know, whatever your beliefs. You will find people <laughs> yes. that 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 share that view, and you will also find a lot of people that have very very different views. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes uh, what makes New York so exciting. Uh, and I think that's what's what's kept us here all all these years. I'd love to hear sort of a only in New York story that oh, yeah. you have bonus points if it involves you know some skilled workers of some sort, but it doesn't have to. Oh, interesting! Only in New York. Um, let me get back to that. Okay. I need to think about something something that's like worthy of a podcast. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair, enough. Fair enough. And that's sort of clean for a podcast. There you go. Right? Like, just think about stuff like rats. Yeah. Well, I think about it because so so we first met when I was at Uber, and yeah. we were thinking a lot about the future of infrastructure yeah. and how cities were changing due to these macro trends around electrification, around autonomy, around things that would 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 fundamentally reduce the cost of mobility. And one thing I was always super impressed by was how forward thinking you and your team always were. And 
I think as you've moved into different roles, that theme continues. And so learning from you a bit about what you see as the most important macro trends right yeah. now is a great place to start. Yeah. Um, no, look, it was it, it was really great working with you guys um, back at Uber Air. Um, I, I, you know, had we known that a big pandemic was coming, <laughs> you know, we would have probably would have changed about, the underwriting. Thought about things a little bit differently, but it's it's really impressive. I was actually catching up with a few of your uh, of your colleagues from back in the day who are a, a lot closer to actually getting some of these EVs, all these like you know flying air taxis uh, that look like drones and fly through the sky. Um, you know, that are actually getting those built right now, which is is pretty incredible if you think about just all the things that need to go right and all the planning that needs to go into that uh, and just a lot of the physical infrastructure that needs to get built to to enable that. Um, but um, zooming back a little bit to, you know, what are the fundamental drivers, right? I mean, the mobility and just getting people around is is such a fundamental part of our of our daily existence right living in big cities like how you get around how you commute is really important yeah um and doing that in a way that's um that's sustainable and safe um is obviously really important and so the question is then how do you you know how do you design the life how do you how do you design the infrastructure around this and if you if you think about it right like in the U.S., the, the the wonderful thing about the U.S. is that the country was not destroyed in two world wars, um, as much of Western Europe has been. So, a lot of Western Europe has had a leg up because you could start from a, from a piece, a clean sheet of paper. Uh, you walk through, you know, the downtown Manhattan, which is where I live with my family, and uh, you can see hundreds of years of a chaotic right. lack of planning. And so the question is, what do you do? You know, like, how do you, in a world where we're thinking not only about what is the infrastructure around us, but what is the infrastructure going to need to look like for the next couple of decades, for the next couple of hundred years, and you layer in the dynamics of sustainability and and just using less resources and, you know, living in an environment that's just uh, less polluting and Mm. better for all of us, what does that mean? And so that brings you back to these large themes of infrastructure redevelopment, a lot of the things that people are talking about in the IRA. But obviously you need the workforce to, you know, to actually get that built, right? Yeah. And so that, I, I think th- the reason why I'm so excited about the work that you guys are doing is that, you know, the the workforce is really that undercurrent um, that is really, really important. I think it's probably a topic that's, that's very often overlooked um, and something I think that, um, you know, where, where you see a lot of different systems in different parts of the world um, mm-hmm. about how people are thinking about, um, you know, about the workforce and how people, you know, yeah. are contributing to that. I'd love to, for everybody's benefit, just take a project and it can be hypothetical, but maybe a real one that you can disguise a little bit and like walk people through some of the numbers mm-hmm. on how you think about the fundamentals of a project like that. So we can talk a bit about the workforce challenge that's behind. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I, People love talking about the solar and wind, right? For example, and um, obviously, a, a lot of the capital that's required for these projects is really has to do with the kit that you're, you know, that you're putting into the ground. You know, yep. like the steel, the solar panels, you know, all the cabling, the connections, uh, the inverters, etc. Um, the thing that's been so exciting about seeing, you know, seeing what's happening in in solar, and essentially seeing a lot of the costs of solar panels absolutely collapse, right? right? You know, reduce, you know, 10x, 20x, 30x, depending on how far you look back. Um, the the key thing that is not collapsing at that rate, in fact, that's increasing uh, at a rate is is labor. Yeah. And so, whereas, you know, when, when and I'm dating myself here, when I started in, in this industry, you know, the early 2000s, yeah. all of this equipment was hugely expensive. Right. And it kind of didn't matter, like, more or less, how how much the labor would cost and and you didn't really think about uh, any efficiency gains in in labor because it was just a small you know a small piece of the of the pie now that labor is such a big part and you're building at industrial scale and everything around you on the construction site is in the process of getting uh, automated and yep. you have much more robotics to help you um, to make that that construction site a lot safer for the people that are working there. 
um, it is actually really important to think about, uh, well, if, if we want to build and, you know, there's, there's all these statistics out there about, you know, how many hundreds of trillions of new infrastructure we're going to need over the next couple of decades. Right. But if you think about that, that will require a lot of people actually installing stuff. Yep. And then, I, I, I mean, it was one of the first couple of businesses that we looked at. Um, we, we looked at a specialty engineering business, one of my first jobs when I was at Macquarie. Uh, and it, it was basically doing a lot of maintenance and repair work for power plants. Okay. And when we sat down with the management team, you know, we wanted to talk all about like, okay, what's your, you know, what's your backlog and can you actually like deliver against yep. that? And the only thing the CEO wanted to talk about was that all of his engineers were retiring. Yep. He couldn't get any new people yep. out of college excited about this work. And so he was like, look, I don't actually care what my backlog is because I don't have the people to actually deliver bottleneck. all that. There's a different bottleneck. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that to me, what, I mean, it was incredibly naive, you know, for, for me, you know, being, you know, the, the, the spreadsheet monkey or, you know, like, like being Sharpen the numbers pencil. and being like, oh, but we can just do this and that. Um, so there's, there are these really big factors that we think about how do we, you know, how do we get the workforce there? especially now with a lot of the reshoring of manufacturing, uh, you know, when, when you and I, when all of us, well, maybe not you, but the two of us, when we, when we grew up, the answer to everything was globalization. That's right. We're just going to outsource it. We're going to send it abroad. We're going to have hugely complex supply chains. That entire logic is sort of being turned on its head now yep. um, from a security perspective, from a sustainability perspective, um, and just also from a perspective of, um, you, you know, of, of getting stuff built, uh, in, a, in a time frame that makes sense. Yep. Um, and so there's, there are really huge shifts in the overall economy. Um, and look, capital is mobile, you know, manufacturing sources are mobile. The only thing that isn't mobile is your workforce. Yep. So that's the real, you know, I, I think you guys are hitting on a really, really crucial part of. I love the example. So, so uh, there's a risk of doing public math or podcast math, but I think it's still a very, Do this it. is a really useful one to pull the thread on. So we think a lot about the skilled trades gap mm -hmm. that would challenge things like industrial grade, yep. utility scale, solar yep. installations, which is a big embedded premise of things like the Inflation Reduction Act. Yep. And the the effort is, is, is bold for sure. But to your point, the challenge here and bringing it to life is multifactorial in its complexity. So um, our family that I grew up in, uh, we have a cattle ranch in, in West Alabama and East Mississippi. An example parcel of land that could be very interesting for a solar development, you know, very open. It's soybean fields right now. It happens to be next door to a big substation that the Tennessee Valley Authority is the utility of record yeah. on. And so it's it's a very reasonable place to go and, and make a bid for one of these projects at pretty large scale. So let's just call it 100 megawatts of capacity. Yeah. A project like that has a five-year backlog on the interconnect. On the permitting, yeah. It's a very substantial amount of time. And then you, you dig in, like, why is that? Why is that the case? And it has to do with a lot of the industrial and engineering services that go to support the underwriting and understanding how it will work. And then the actual process of then moving those things to the queue is, is tough. And so as, as you think about that as an investor, like what are the key levers? Yeah. Well, what, one, of the, one of the really key things, the, taking a 10-year view that I think um, we really need to think about in this country is just how we're bringing people into technical jobs. Mm. And this sort of coming, coming from a perspective of a German, right? Um, about 60% of kids that leave high school go into uh, what's called like a, essentially like a dual education program yep. where um, you spend time uh, in a technical college, you know, getting some, you know, getting some skills at, you know, in, in, in a variety of trades. Um, but you also spend time with the company. Yep. And so there is, a, there's a model where you're, uh, where you're learning in school uh, and you're learning on the job. And so that, that enables a lot of you know a lot of kids out of high school to really you know get driven into fields that they probably didn't even know existed yep 
Um, it allows a lot of the companies to really find and nurture and mentor talent. Um, and it, and it, you know, allows the system to really draw in, you know, hundreds of thousands, um, of, you know, of, of labor that, that we, that were required, um, yeah. you know, to actually, you know, to, you know, to actually get stuff built. Um, you compare that to, to the U S system where about two thirds of kids that are, that are leaving high school are, you know, are going t into a four year uh, degree program. And that's wonderful, right? Like it's, and college is still the path to to a high paying job, but I think this that that pathway, you know, into into the trades, I think, is something that uh, what you know, one of the few things maybe that my home country has gotten right. Totally. Uh, but as you're thinking about, uh, you know, from a from a political policy perspective, um, it, it's it's relatively easy, you know, in a in you know it. A lot of things being equal to say, okay, we got to deploy 360 billion over 10 years through the Inflation Reduction Act, um, you know, to bring back manufacturing. Um, yes, that's obviously hugely bold and very, very complicated politically, but it's actually relatively easy when you compare it to the the math of saying, okay, now how do we get right. millions of people? Right. Uh, you know, butts and seats. Right. To actually make sure that that we can, you know, that we can physically deliver against that. Yep. That's actually a much harder problem, um, and I think it's also a much harder problem because there is, um, you know, there is this sort of view that, um, you know, that blue collar jobs like aren't as valuable, right, mm. or like aren't as aren't as useful, and decades and decades and decades of of this this narrative. Of uh, y you know of, of of having kids you know yep. look for look for other things to do. So I think that is that is probably a much more pressing issue. It's it's not something that you can fix with money, um, and it's going to take quite a long time. Uh, but it's 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 hugely important if you want if you know if you want this energy transition to actually work. What what are this what are the secrets to the German system? Why does the apprenticeship system work? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things is it's, it's considered, it, it's considered quite prestigious mm. to go into that. Um, there was, and mind you, I, I did not study in, in Germany, so I'm like sure a bad person to actually, you know, talk about this, but, um, it's, if I, I know all of my friends from high school, Anyone who was anyone wanted to, you know, work for Porsche or BMW or like, you know, some car company or some engineering company because they made all the cool stuff, right? Like uh, they, they, you know, they made all the, all, all the products that, right. uh, you know, that like as, you know, as a boy or a girl, you wanted to play with. Um, and so that was the fastest way into these companies yeah. Uh, and the the salaries that that you would make, as, you know, first of all, as a, as an apprentice, you got an employment contract and you were paid on day one. So you you leave high school, you're you're going through a technical college, but you have a salary. So it's it's a very egalitarian way, you know, irrespective of what your background is. Also, university is free in Germany, right? So there's no you know, there's not this this question of can you afford college. The, this concept that people are coming out of college hugely indebted is like very funny. not a thing to yeah. you know to to people in Western Europe. I actually think it's it's one of the reasons why um, you know why why it's just so hard in you know in this system because you have a lot of kids that go to college don't really know what they're supposed to study, you know, and then sort of four years later and you know three three switches later, you know, find themselves with a hundred thousand dollars of debt. Right. Um, and are, you know, that's, that's a pretty, you know, big nut to, uh, you know, to, that's right. to, to, to try and get, get yourself. So the fact that there is a, a pathway into industry that you're getting paid and that it's just socially seen as something very prestigious, I think are all these things that are, that are making, uh, you know, that are just, that are just driving a lot of talent, um, you know, into, you know, into, into the productive workforce there. Yeah. Mm. There's a lot to learn in that I'm system. Like, that sounds really smart. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. And look, and there's a lot of drawbacks and, 
you know, at, at the same level, the the American economy and the American labor market is so much more dynamic. I mean, I you know, I'm an economic refugee myself, right? It's like, if it, if this is so awesome, you know, like why am I sitting here? Or why am I not back back in Berlin, right? But um, uh, so there's lots of drawbacks as well. But I think the for the for the median person, uh, I think there's there's just a lot of opportunity. Um, and yeah, that's, and that's before we talk about well, we, a lot of it. We think a lot about it at the firm level yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. So we support a lot of companies that are looking to build their own apprenticeship programs or already have, in many cases, built them. And one of the big challenges that they face is, unlike a European model, there isn't a lot of support from the state. Yeah. It's a it's a business case that has to stand on its own feet in the context of how you're going to show some type of return on human capital that you're investing in. And so you become also very subject to the retention risk of those employees. And it's really great that the U.S. system is so dynamic that at-will employment allows for people to kind of vote with their feet if they don't like the culture or, or other parts of their job. It makes it awfully, awfully difficult to underwrite a bigger ongoing investment in apprenticeship as the firm. And so I think that there's interesting things to learn about a system that takes a point of view that we want to increase the workforce capacity in the system because that's how we're going to increase like overall GDP growth. And then the question about who delivers the training is an open one. Is it a community college? Is it a trade school? Is it the company itself? And making the dollar somewhat flexible to follow the learner yeah. is an interesting policy mechanism that doesn't require any new spending yeah. and just requires some flexibility on the dollars that are out there. It's like your 401k, like it sort of moves with you. Yeah. 100%, like a lifeline learning yeah. account. Yeah, yeah. And you can you can conceive of a model now where as an employer making a bet on a young person saying, I'm going to pay them on day one, even though they're not technically qualified yet to do this job, but I'm really excited to do that because their in, intrinsics, their work ethic, their grit, their coachability are off the charts. Mm. Pretty soon their technical skills going to be there as well. It works when you have highly productive jobs where you can attribute revenue to a skilled worker. It is more challenging when attribution's tougher because you're on a manufacturing line or mm. it's a little bit less clear how to differentiate the most productive from the least productive person yeah. on the team. So I think it's very possible that it starts with roles that have like very clear job and ticket level attribution of revenue growth because you can under underwrite that so much more tightly. Mm. Now, if only there was a software platform where we can track <laughs> those things, right? Someone should work on that. I know. It's true. I know. But it's true. <laughs> um, advice you have for entrepreneurs out there that are looking to make big investments in mm -hmm. infrastructure, either directly themselves or through yeah, operations. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's, it's funny. It's something that we think about a lot in, in the whole context of the energy transition. And, you know, m maybe just step back a little bit, right? There's a lot of excitement about climate tech, energy tech. It's funny, the moniker has changed a few times. You know, it used to be called clean tech. You know, then there was a clean tech winter. Uh, now it's called climate tech. Uh, it sort of all, all, all means similar things. Um, what, what I've looked at, and you know, we, we sort of looked at this a little bit in, in, in my prior job, was um, just where the money's going, follow the money, and just looking at the supply and demand um, what is absolutely wonderful is that there are a lot of new startups in this space and there's a lot of capital for these startups. So, you know, back in the day, um, you know, when I got started, the, the, the concept of, you know, a pre-seed round for some idea that, you know, that was, that was on a piece of paper outside of Silicon Valley, candidly was laughable, mm. right? Now... You know, I can, you know, I, I probably tonight there's three events here in New York where you can pitch a climate tech startup to some investors and get funded, you know, like almost immediately. So it's, it's wonderful that there's, that there's, you know, that there's this understanding and that there is this, this community around it. Um, if you look at some of the numbers, there's arguably an oversupply of capital for early stage venture in climate tech. And you see that there, a lot of early stage funds have been raised, and especially now with the fundraising environment getting a little bit tougher, a lot of the funds are skewing a little bit smaller 
And so what that means is that they're skewing earlier because that's the only way how you can make the portfolio math mm. work. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the very early stage of, you know, of, of where we're at. You look at the other end of the barbell, sort of the late stage private equity, late stage infrastructure through the cycles, um, that, that asset class is relatively well understood, you know, has very deep backings and especially the large platforms, you know, that are managing several billion have very good access to capital. Mm. So I would say the supply and demand on the late stage on the, you know, the, you know, billion dollar plus, um, you know, tickets is very much there. On the early stage, it's, you know, there's too much capital and not enough ideas. In the middle, um, it's actually flipped around. So there's, as these, as these climate tech companies are growing up and they're now not raising five or 10 million, they're doing really well. They need to raise 20, 50, $75 million. Now, all of a sudden, the early stage uh, funds are tapping out uh, and there actually isn't enough growth capital in between. So writing the you know, 50 to $200 million uh, checks. Um, and there's a real dearth. And so people used to talk about the valley of death yeah, of, you know, of, of a lot of these startups. You, know, you, would, get, you would develop some technology uh, and it looks really promising, but then, you know, you have to pilot it and you have to go through and, and you know, and, and basically yeah. you, 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 you know, you get, uh, you, you get killed in, in the meantime, cause you don't, you're not making it to like, you know, the, the, the full on rollout, um, in, in climate investing, it's very much like that mm -hmm. where you've got a really promising technology and you're doing some pilots and, you know, and you've got some very early commercial traction, but you're not you know, you're not getting that that incremental financing because you're not sort of there where it's fully de-risked and you've got uh, an engineering shop that writes a bankability report on you and you've got, you're signing 10-year off-tech contracts with the U.S. government, right? <clears throat> and so that is really where the, where the biggest capital opportunity mismatch is. Mm. Um, and that was a very big driver for, you know, why, why I'm sitting in the seat that I'm sitting in today because the the organization that I'm working uh, with today is actually really much focused on that mm. middle piece and taking a lot of the companies that are coming out of the early stage growth and essentially helping them grow to um, you know to the late stage private equity infrastructure world. Yeah, um, that's where that's where it, it's it's a pure it's a pure su supply demand side. Uh, I think you know. That math is going to change over time, but today, and probably for the next couple of years, um, that's really where there is there is the biggest uh, dearth of capital, and and therefore the largest opportunity set uh, from an from an investor perspective. This episode is brought to you by Maverick. Maverick understands that building is more than just about laying bricks; it's about protecting your hard work. And that's why they offer specifically tailored insurance for construction. In the complex world of building where regulations shift and costs climb, it's crucial to have a partner who not only understands your industry, but also stands by to support you. Maverick is that partner. They provide comprehensive coverage, including builder's risk, general liability insurance, workers' compensation, and structural warranties, ensuring that you're fully protected. Insurance is complicated. Call Maverick at 727-308-2179 or visit them online at maverickbuilders.com so they can help you get back to building. What is the scorecard that you use to assess if it's a good fit? You know, there there's a few things of you know, like is the round size big enough? Right. You know, what uh, sort of just a few financial metrics. But if you think about it, for these companies, um, the question is, is this like is there binary technology risk? Or if there is, then we we can't take it. Um, we also spend a lot of time looking at the team, like, and not only not only the CEO and not only the founder, but really sort of the bench, um, or, you know, around the senior management team. Um, do they have experience? Um, and and especially, you know, in the energy transition world, who like what partners are they around? Do they know how to negotiate an EPC contract? Right? Like, do they you know have they worked with construction crews before? You know what offtake uh, agreements are in place. 
uh, you know, how, how do you, you know, how do you go about financing the rollout of these companies? So there's a lot of, I would say there's a lot of like hard metrics, but then also just a lot of soft metrics around, you know, what is, what is the culture that this team has built? Um, are they attracting talent? Is there retention? You know, are people staying, um, are they, you know, are they addressing, uh, topics and problems that are, that are big enough? Is there a market for that? You know, what are, and a lot of it is just, you know, like what, what are the contractual relationships of this, of this company, both on, you know, the inputs and the outputs, um, and, and are the, do the unit economics stack up? Because it's, it's, it's wonderful to have a great idea, but, uh, you know, in this capitalist society that we live in, you know, unless you can make money, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's not going to scale sustainably. Yeah. When the unit economics aren't there, because a lot, for a lot of firms, that was not the most important thing to solve. Yes. You know, at Series C and A, and sometimes right. even at B. Um, when you see unit economics not t- tying, is it because they're operating with too many services tied to the? I know it's hard to it's hard to generalize, but where yeah. where it tends to be the place where it falls? Yeah, um, upside down. Yeah, no, and this is sort of exactly what we're looking for, right? Because we're looking to take scale up risk. So, for for me, the thing that I really focus on is. Uh, the, the unit economics may be really attractive and they may work, but you just don't have the scale. You're not making enough widgets, you know, building enough projects where, um, you know, all of the rest of the team that you have around is, is operating efficiently. Um, but if you just, you know, double, triple, 5x, you know, the widgets that you're building or the stuff that you're building then as a, as a company, as a going concern for the company, then it works. Mm. That's exciting for us, right? Like that's yeah. exactly what we're looking to, to bet. Um, there are a few technologies that I think are just going to struggle very long term. Um, and even if you make some really heroic assumptions on cost curves coming down, on, you know, government funding being there to, you know, to bridge these technologies, it it may not be enough, right? And so then that's, those are the kinds of bets that, you know, my, my venture colleagues are taking. And if they get it right, it's a hundred bagger. They return right. the fund and they, you know, and you know, they're, they're on, you know, on, on, on the first page of time magazine, uh, right. you know, I, as a, as an investor, I'm looking for the sort of like the doubles, the triples, the boring stuff, the non-sexy stuff, but the stuff where we can deploy billions of dollars of capital. Um, you know, as opposed to looking for a few of these mood shots. Mm-hmm. Boring is boring is my motto. It served me very well, <laughs> like in, in personal life and in professional. You make life. it seem interesting. Said, none of this is boring. I'm just yeah, it's not no, boring it's good. to us. It's good. We 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 we've been thinking a lot about ways software creates leverage mm-hmm. for companies to be able to address a workforce shortage, and there's <clears throat> probably three levers that we're testing. The first is how to get more people into the supply base. So this is taking somebody that is unskilled yeah. and helping them build a skill quickly. And if you take the point of view that largely these are competency-driven jobs and not time-based jobs from a mastery standpoint, you can find people that have really good intrinsics and make them skilled quickly. The second lever is production. It's how much output you can generate for every labor hour mm-hmm. of people in the system. And often the challenge around productivity is you have a, a hardworking person, but they're just not set up with the right tools to be as impactful as they could be. Yeah. And so technology plays a really cool role in helping drive more incremental output per hour. And then the third lever is retention. So if you can create a better experience for somebody so that they feel more appreciated, they feel more rewarded, there's a chance to participate in the value that they're creating. And that's really interesting from a, a wages growth standpoint. Well, gosh, that's pretty powerful. Now I want to stick around in the industry at the company much longer. And so if you get more people in and they all produce more and they stick around longer, that's a way to increase productivity significantly. Yeah. And if you, if, if you look at it from like a, t- a time and materials as being the big drivers of cost in many of these companies, being able to reduce the time that is required to get a product project done yeah. materially increases the profitability of that project too. So that's that's the way we're approaching it. I'm curious about things you've seen from a technology standpoint that have been most interesting 
around how to increase productivity? Yeah. Um, a, a lot of it is really driven by automation and and robotics mm -hmm. and taking um, taking sort of manual processes and just making them a lot more repeatable uh, quickly. Um, and and s some of that means that you may actually need fewer people on it. Um, very often, though, what it means is you need more specialization and you need people that actually are, uh, you know, back to sort of my, my welding example, right? Like if you have an order book that's big enough and, you know, you can have an awesome guy who is, a, you know, an ace welder and and he is welding all day, every day, not only does he or she become, you know, even better at their job, but, you know, their their work product becomes, you know, becomes even better. Um, and it sort of becomes this, you know, this virtuous cycle. Mm. Whereas if you're in a situation where, you know, people are sort of moving around, it's a little bit chaotic. It takes, um, you know, it takes a lot of time to mobilize and demobilize and move in between jobs. Um, that's when we see sort of this downward spiral, right? Where like people get demotivated. Um, you've got this attrition problem that, you know, that you had mentioned. Um, and so it's, it's really, is really building that expertise and, you know, and building that specificity, um, and making sure that, you know, the, you're, you're really guiding that specialization where, where you do find yourself in a way where, where it's this upward spiral. Um, and that's where, that's where these businesses just become really competitive and really like really great. And it almost doesn't matter. Like it's, it's a little bit, you know, like I have this conversation with, you know, we use a lot of lawyers, you know, for all this, these deals that it's always these, you know, these comments that you have, you know, if you have a really good lawyer, uh, it, 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 you know, it, you can afford to pay that lawyer a lot of money per hour, uh, because the, the output, the work product that you're getting is, is just so much better. Um, and it's, it's, it's worth all your money. And it's the same thing with, you know, with the, with, with the skilled trades, right? If you, if you do not need to rework, if you don't have any defects, if you know, you're not going to have any, any liability claims, um, that, that really matters. Now it may not matter over the course of a week or a month. And this is where sort of the incentive timelines, you know, need to be properly calibrated. But if you're a business owner, you're sure as hell going to care about that, right? right. Uh, the problem is, you know, if you're Boeing and you're you're you know managing for your next quarterly earnings, uh, it, it may not matter, right? So and and you're solving for different things. So I think, not to bash that company, but I, I think having the incentive alignment is really important. Uh, and and making sure that the teams that you're working on are thinking like owners and are you know and are incentivized with the right long-term incentives is is hugely important because that you know that drives the right outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think about this in the context of how do you reward people and yeah. recognize them for doing the right thing. Um, and we've been we've been testing lots of ideas around best practice adherence and how do you really celebrate it. I'm curious about your views on artificial intelligence and mm. machine learning and how those types of tools can solve a problem related to best practices and ensuring people have that right alignment. Are you seeing anything that you find compelling? Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, right? Like AI has become such a buzzword. Um, I, I don't think I see like a single company pitch that doesn't find a way to <laughs> like shoehorn. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, there's... Uh, you know, to, to add AI in, um, but to, um, but to think about it, look, I think it's, if you think about what, what artificial intelligence can do and what AI can do just in terms of, of further empowering the workers, right. And, and it can be, and it can be anything from, you know, the, the person who's on the assembly line in, in a, in a prior job, uh, you know, we, we were invested in a fully electric industrial yard truck company and they're called Orange GV. Um, and one of the big things for them was making sure that uh, the folks on the assembly line 
are following instructions and are really going through checklists, right? And basically having this industrial process that makes sure that quality and the product is sort of exactly where it needs to be. Um, right now, all of that stuff is printed out on pieces of paper. Yeah. Um, it it looks pretty cumbersome, uh, and um, and it's it's not super elegant, but it works. Uh, I can definitely see a world where you know the, the the future worker will you know just have some glasses on, you know, and we'll get some prompts there, and there's a there's a level of quality control in that. Um, that kind of technology already exists in offshore oil rigs. Um, and in in a few other uh, you know in in a few other applications where you are very far away from somewhere or it's or it's hard to have um, you know the cost of having to redo something is is very very high so I think those are those are sort of some of the first areas you know medicine um, is is sort of another one that you know that people always like to cite um, but even it, you know, even in something like very pedestrian, right? Like coding or even just like writing emails. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. you know, you have so, uh, you know, you have, emails. you have someone that says, Hey, how about, how about I respond this way? And then you say, Oh, that's, that's actually a much more eloquent way than what I would have come up <laughs> yes. with. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so, so there's, I think there's a lot of, there, there's a lot to be said about productivity. I think we're, we're definitely, it, it feels like we're, you know, we're on the upward slope of the, uh, you know, uh, of the hype scale um, around around a lot of things AI. But I think when you, you know, when we sort of go go over the peak and you know come down on the other side, I think we we will see that there's just a lot of really useful things um, that will just make our our daily life uh, more productive and uh, you know more pleasant. And so so you know we'll we'll all get to benefit from that. I agree. Well said. That's very hopeful. That's been going through my head this whole time is when you are working in an industry that has some just massive and arguably scary, depressing problems yeah. that you're trying to solve. How do you remain hopeful and excited that, you know, we can do we can do this? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'm I'm a relatively optimistic person to begin with. Fair. And I mean, like, what you? You know, the world's ending if we don't do anything. <laughs> so you can either you can either freak out and you can have fear be you know be your guiding force, and you know sometimes it's quite good to like get a jolt, uh, right? Because um, you know, yeah, not to scare anyone, but like this is the decade where we have to nail it. Yeah. Because otherwise, we're going to be battling temperatures. We're going to be battling floods. We're going to be battling all kinds of natural disasters. Uh, so now's the time. The thing that makes me really optimistic is just thinking about what the what what the overall scenario is that we're that we're looking into. So when when I started my career, working in clean tech was a really bizarre and geeky and niche thing to do. And um, at, yeah, I'm still still involved with uh, campus recruiting and sort of you know talking to some students that are you know that are thinking about like what's their first job out of college and for some reason you know investing in climate tech has become super cool uh and and just the amount of talent that the industry is now attracting is absolutely phenomenal and it, we we saw this you know a few years ago it was really tough to uh actually you know, get tech talent, right? And you were always competing and candidly, we were always losing against, you know, some of the big, you know, the Googles, the Metas, the Amazons of the world. That has now changed a little bit, you know, as these industries have, you know, have been right-sizing uh, themselves. Um, and so there's just this incredible inflow of talent um, and, you know, a, a generation of folks. And, you know, people always like to, you know, like to... Uh, like to talk down to like, you know, the new kids and oh, they, you know, have no work ethic and they, you know, and they don't care. Um, I actually find the absolute opposite. I find that uh, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the, the young students that are coming, you know, that, that are joining the workforce are incredibly mission driven, mm -hmm. have a really clear sense of purpose, mm -hmm. have a strong desire of working uh, in companies 
that that they like, but also working in a broader cause. Uh, and so I am I am incredibly hopeful just looking at that and seeing and seeing the amount of talent that's uh, that's going to the right place. Mm. That's great. That's great. Why Team you... optimistic too, that's but it's great. helpful to hear it from people boots on the ground actually talking to Gen Z. I'm like, especially with what you do, it's like, well, they're going to be on the planet longer than the rest of like this. Yeah. They're, you know, we, we're here too and perhaps we could be resentful of previous generations for not setting us up the best but now yeah, we're gonna check out yeah, earlier that's for sure exactly. yeah. <laughs> they kind of, they got all right let's lighten your round not to be dark okay we start with a book recommendation how did you frame it a book a book that has caused you after reading it to change your behavior in some way oh wow um well um not to sort of get super dark about this but uh, <laughs> go for it i already went there um, keep going there so um, my my father passed away when I was um, w- you know when I was a late teenager, um, and I found myself in a situation where I had to, you know, very quickly just, you know, take on responsibilities that I thought you know I was not going to have to carry for you know several decades, um, and so I actually read a book that's called uh, the the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, um, that and and I'm sort of not Buddhist you know by any you know, stretch of the imagination, but there is just a, there was a broader vision of resilience and of, um, and of acceptance of, of your, you know, life's fate that, um, you know, as a, as a late teenager was, uh, you know, was very helpful to me. Um, and I think has really changed, you know, at the time just really changed how, you know, how I approached life and, um, you know, how, how how I acted. In other news, I actually don't read a lot these days. I've got two little kids. They keep me very busy. I travel a lot. Um, what I will say is, um, and I'm not getting paid for this, The Economist makes very, very good podcasts. And so there's one really good podcast series called The Prince about China and Xi. And there is... This is excellent. Yeah. There's one really good one called A Year in Moscow, which is about Putin and the Ukraine war. Mm. Uh, and those are, you know, uh, I think I, you know, keep up with current events and I, you know, like reading books every once in a while, but this was just a really, really good way of distilling a lot of, you know, you learn a lot about the history and, you know, you just get right. a lot of, a lot of in-depth um, analysis that you, you know, that you wouldn't get otherwise. So, yeah. That's great. So, yeah. So. The Prince. The Prince and a year in Moscow. A year in Moscow. Yeah. In The Prince, they, they chronicle Xi Jinping's experience coming to Iowa. Yeah, in exactly. The, yeah. In the 70s, he was an exchange student and he's like at the, at the fair riding a tractor. This is his introduction. Right, to or, you know, or something. Uh, and he befriends a young governor, Terry Branstad, who he like forms this lifelong relationship with. Uh, so much so that Branstad becomes the ambassador to China in the last administration and was on a much closer relationship with President Xi than many of our uh, previous ambassadors yeah. had been. It's a really wild story. Yeah. Yeah. No, Those are really good racks of podcast. Yeah. And you answered lightning round question number two, which was do you have any podcast racks? Oh, so there you go. You- there you go. Two and one. Two and one. Exactly. Two and one. Double yeah. lightning. Yeah. Tools. This is one of my favorite. This is becoming, I think, my favorite question in our lightning round. What are some tools, most likely productivity tools or hacks or habits that you have and would recommend? Interesting. Um, well, I was just reflecting on this and uh, my my wife was reminding me that I still have a lot of um, of like paper booklets that... so. I, I always used to have like pen and paper and would just have, you know, like a, like a notepad and basically scribble some notes on to do lists, you know, like meeting notes, whatever. Um, I, I have gone fully digital. Uh, and the one thing that I find that is wonderful about being fully digital is you can actually find stuff hmm. always. Um, and so w- what if, you know, I've been using Salesforce a lot. Um, there's many other free tools. Um, 
And there's also just things like writing notes uh, or like writing an email to yourself, uh, especially, you know, like I've switched jobs a couple of times over the decades. Uh, you know, if I've emailed myself to my personal email, I can, you know, pull up an email, you know, like, or, or some, you know, some interesting report or something that I read, you know, 10 years after, like, and search used to be really painful. Search has gotten much, 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 much better. Um, and so retrieving, retrieving the, things digitally is is has become so much easier whereas you know before i would ruffle through you know (laughs) stacks stacks of paper um and and would give up in a you know in a very frustrated manner but yeah so that's it's not it's not glamorous but i think that's 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 my productivity hook um my memory is not where i'd like to be so yes search of all the notes but i'm also a handwritten note person as well where is the ai or tool that i like i don't know set my phone oh, on I've, the thing and it goes well so i've actually i've actually well so that exists what is it um oh. uh, uh, i actually don't know what it's called but you know it, it definitely exists and then yeah. the other thing that i've seen is pretty cool is that um you can you know ai just reads some samples of your handwriting and then learns how to handwrite and so i've seen you know, like a little a little robotic arm with a pen, like writing handwritten notes in exactly your handwriting. So, uh, you know, the next time you're, you know, organizing a dinner party for 250 people or writing wedding invites or whatever. I know, just did like, that last year. Oh, there you Who go. You? Congratulations. Oh, <laughs> and uh, our closing question is, how can listeners help you right now? What are projects you have going on? How can they help me? The people uh, could be useful. Find me good, you know, good growth companies that we should invest into you know we're writing 50 to 200 million dollar checks into companies that um you know are growing quickly have you know have substantial revenue um and um you know are looking to to solve the you know some facet of the energy transition so uh you know come come find me on social and pitch me the deal that's right request for startups that last bullet point requirement I was like, if you wrote me a $50 million check, I would do good things in the world, I promise, but I'm not specifically <laughs> doing that last one. We got to get the, your unit economics up and <laughs> revenue. Yeah. Revenue is the key. Where uh, can we find you on social? Oh, on social? Prefer? So so I'm only on LinkedIn. I, I okay. consume through, you know, Instagram and TikTok and Facebook, but I, uh, I do not post. I... Uh, it, there's just too much craziness out there. LinkedIn. Yeah. Heard yeah. It? Very, very old and boring. You said boring a few times. I'm like, it just sounds efficient. That's, yeah. we like boring. Yeah. This has been a fun conversation. Thank you for joining us. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you for your friendship and believing in this mission. And we're really excited to collaborate with you in the future. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.